<laughs> All right, so today we're going to be talking about oval placements and uh, basically portable marbles. This is actually the setup for my signature series. And I've already got the opal preheating in the kiln. Uh, so that's ready to go. Um, we're going to start by encasing that opal. I'll connect it up to the clear glass that will become the core. And uh, from there, keep building marble around that core. So, we've got our small spherical opal in the tip of this tube. Okay. Alright, we're just going to uh, collapse the tube around it. Got to make sure that you work all the air out to avoid trapping bubbles. So notice I change the angle of the tube based on how I want the glass to flow. I'll never hold it at an upward angle. That would be a good method for trapping air. But I'll change the steepness of this downward angle to help control the glass to flow around the open. <laughs> That's fully in case. Now we just uh, remove any glass with bubbles and any bubbles. Tungsten tweezers are, in my opinion, a must have tool. So helpful to get into this tight area to the flame, just peel glass away. So if you have any bubbles, you just keep peeling that glass away until you get rid of the bubbles. Um, sometimes you have to basically scrape off the opal to the point where there's no glass covering it almost and try again. That's just the nature of, of working with opals. So Now we're going to attach that opal to our clear glass that will become the core of the marble. One of the big things that I really try to uh, push folks to do in their glass blowing processes is set themselves up for the next piece. So the tip of this tube is not really very rounded and I'm going to be encasing another opal in there when I make the next marble and it's already hot. So take the couple seconds now while you already got the heat in there to blow it out to the shape you need. If you want a cold tube to put a cold opal in, and now that tube is ready to just cool down and ready to accept an opal as soon as it's cool. I'm adding some more clear glass to the opposite side of the opal. That will provide the clear glass in the core of the vortex that will be beneath the opal. Remove that clear glass. Arboring the tip to get it ready for my next opal encasement. It's the only better appendage I guess I would use the rest of this piece for, so either way it's nice to have it symmetrical. So the same principle as I was mentioning a minute ago. Setting yourself up so you're ready for the next one. Alright, so now we've got an opal encased within the clear glass. Now you do your pattern, whatever pattern you're going to do um, for the inside of your vortex. There might be one little bubble I'd like to get rid of. Take a look here. Pretty minimal. Probably can't even see it until that glass is blowing. So now I see it. I'm gonna use those tungsten tweezers. Just pick out that little piece of glass with the bubble in. Super handy to be able to just rip that out of there, going into the flame if needed with those tweezers. All right. 
now you're going to put your backing color. Sometimes you need a backing color, sometimes you don't. It all depends on the pattern that you're doing on the inside. This one needs something dark behind it, so I use a lot of the Chinese blue. Nice, affordable color that when you put black on the outside of your marble or something dark or solid opaque color, this basically acts as black. You're not going to get any light through the marble anyway, so you can get away with things through blue. A lot of the uh, little tips and tricks I've learned about marble making um, have come from a number of the marble making classes I've taken. So tungsten tweezers were recommended to me by John Kabuki in 2008. It was actually my first professional level class. It was one of his flower making classes, flower marble class, out in Eugene, Oregon at the Eugene Glass School. Pretty neat. I feel pretty fortunate that I was around for the era where that place was uh, a mecca for glass information sharing. I was thinking that what made me think about that is the next step is to uh, remove any bubbles that may have gotten trapped when you added that blue glass. Definitely going to have one or two probably in this one it looks like. And the bubble popping flame I learned. I learned that from Gates and Reco, world renowned for his universe marbles. Learned from Gates and down at uh, Marble Crazy, the marble show in Kansas City or outside of there at Bonner Springs. He was the uh, featured artist there once or maybe twice in the years that I was there. And uh, that's where I learned the bubble popping flame. Very nice pinpoint flame, very driving, very hot, but very small. Kind of the smallest flame you can get that's still driving in a moment. Center that on the bubble. It just pops it right for you. Another thing I really like to do that I always encourage folks um, is make it easier on yourself you know like so oftentimes when you're getting into this you're like oh it's no big deal to spin that diameter rod for days on end but I started realizing you can use the diameters of the glass rods like gears so you give yourself a smaller handle on a larger diameter rod it means less work for your hand to make full rotations so you're saving your hand work now I'm going from an 8 millimeter to a 10 millimeter, so that's only about a 20% gain in uh, reduction in energy usage, if you will. But when you start stepping up to the larger diameter rods that are inevitably more heavy, uh, that's where it can really benefit you. So it might seem kind of silly to a lot of folks to put an 8 millimeter handle on a 10 millimeter rod, but I find the, that principle to be really important and uh, something that you at least want to keep in mind if you want to do this for a lifetime. The other thing I like about doing it is that it helps me size up the, uh, the marble I'm making. I use the exact same amount of clear glass at the exact same diameter rod every time I make specific size marbles. So all of my marbles these days are sized specifically an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, two inch, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, five, and six. And I have uh, an exact amount of clear glass, a specific diameter, uh, that I use for all those sizes of marbles. And that way I know how much clear needs to go into the lens of the marble. 
it's a really common mistake to just start making a marble and all of a sudden you made your cone on your vortex too big so you have to make a bigger marble than you planned on and now you don't have enough clear glass to make a proportionately sized lens you can still round it out you can still pull it off but i personally don't like marbles where the vortex is two-thirds of the sphere and the lens is only a third i always shoot for 50 50. and so by prepping my my setup with the clear rod there I know that by the time I'm done making this marble, I should have about two inches left of this 10 millimeter rock. So I condensed some of the lens, I expanded the equator. Now I'm gonna start the termination process, heating up the back of that cone, and then moving the glass to get a nice termination, create a nice cone shape. Convex on the surface profile of the cone, whereas if you stretch it flat or concave, you're going to get a much tighter, more tunneling effect to your vortex. Removing more and more material to get that cone or that funnel shape because I know how important it is and how it makes the marbles look and uh, I've got room to spare. Again, it's really easy and really common to make this cone longer than it should be based on the size of the marble that you're going for. <clears throat> This cone shape is what determines the feel of your vortex. Does your, the inside of your marble feel like a, a cavern, like a, a room in a cave? It's probably because you've got a pretty open cone or even an anti-cone, you know, maybe a little bit rounded by the time it gets to that point, uh, at the bottom of the termination. Uh, I guess what I mean by that is that it might be convex on the surface profile of the cone, whereas if you stretch it flat or concave, you're going to get a much tighter, more tunneling effect to your vortex. I have no problem removing more and more material to get that cone to that funnel shape because I know how important it is and how it makes the marbles look. And uh, I've got room to spare. Again, it's really easy and really common to make this cone longer than it should be based on the size of the marble that you're going for. And so ripping off a lot is not, uh, not a bad thing. <clears throat> Another nice thing this blue glass does for us <clears throat> is it allows us to see in through into the cone so you can see where your opal is super common, well not super common, but I've had it happen, where you keep terminating and terminating to kind of get that looking right, and you accidentally suck the opal right out of the bottom of your vortex. So using that cobalt blue glass lets you keep an eye on it while you're doing that. Now you simply add your filler around the cone. This is the material you're going to need to uh, make the back half into a hemisphere.
So, here's our filler layer. Top of the tone. Now we're ready to add the backing to cover up that filler. Another little tip for you. I love buying odds because I get thicker rods and I get thin rods. If you're backing a marble on the small end of things, like this inch and a quarter, it's really easy to get a lot more material than you need uh, in your backing. And that adds a lot of volume to the piece. So I love it with odds how you sometimes get these nice, like, five millimeter rods. They're perfect for backing inch and a quarter marbles. Right. Now, we'll start to melt down the rest of the clear rod and uh, gather up the lens and get closer to our final diameter for the marble. Again, I'm watching my clear rod left of the flame to see how much is left. That's a really good indicator for me when I've gathered enough. If you remember earlier, I said there should be about two inches left. So I'm gonna get that two inch mark, that's where I'm gonna stop. I'll continue rounding the marble from here. And if I need more, I've got it. I mean, I can always add it, but it's harder and you end up fighting yourself and end up, you end up making a bigger marble usually because of it. If you just melt it all in and then figure out what size it is from there. So I would recommend that you guys take notes uh, of your process. If you're anything like me, you have a horrible memory, and I always think that I'll remember all the little tips and tricks and things I've learned about a process, but I don't. So I just have a note section in my phone where I add notes about the process. I say, oh, this marble took me you know, eight inches of 10 mil, uh, and then maybe a week later, a couple months goes by, I come back to that process again, I'm like, Oh, this time it only took me six inches, so I'll make a note of that. And it's not that I keep an exact log, but I try to take notes on those important uh, teachable moments, if you will, so that I don't forget them, because a lot of times it's months between when I make a series and when I come back to it. So I might make a run of something and then not make anything like that for several months. So when I come back to it, it's super helpful to have those notes to reference back on to save me from messing up a couple or making two that are, you know, a little bigger than I want them to be in order to relearn that thing that I already learned. So take notes. It's not a bad thing. It's not lame. It's not like you're being a nerd. It's just being smart and efficient. So my background patterns are uh, unique to the year I made them. I'm still figuring that out for this year, so I'm still prototyping. This year I'm experimenting with silver and different fuming applications. I just did one silver fuming application, and now I've got a rod of glass with more silver in it for another one. ready for a punch and then we'll be ready to finish this up and we're gonna get a nice blast of croaking here momentarily. Perfect timing because we are just about out. Alright, so we put our first punty onto the back side there so we can melt off the clear rod and start rounding out the front side of the vortex. Now we're cooking with gas. I'm removing just a little bit of clear here. As I can tell, I have a little bit more than I needed. And again, set this up for your next one. Don't leave a big blob there. It's already hot. Take a couple seconds to marble it down. 
My left hand wouldn't be doing anything else anyway, so I guess it's really taking any more time to do that now, but definitely takes you more time to do it later in the last it's starting to hold it. All right, we got it rounded out. Now it's time to start checking the surface of the marble and for any imperfections. So in addition to my overhead lights, I always encourage glass blowers to have fluorescent or some strip LED equivalent. So you have a nice long beam of light to check for the reflection on the surface of the glass. I also use the flame of my torch. That helps cast a nice long reflection on there, especially because I can get really close to it. Then I just watch that reflection as I rotate it back and forth. That, re that reflection bends, wavers, distorts. And now I've got a little imperfection in the surface of the glass. Another thing I realized I do, I just discovered this the other day. Um, I was teaching about checking for marbles uh, and their smoothness, and you like close one eye. Just like I'm sighting something in, and, you know, you close your non-dominant eye and just use your dominant eye. So you can really focus on that reflection. I also look with and without my glasses. Uh, I love to look without my glasses most of the time, but I also want this piece so close to my face that there's a lot of heat coming off of it, so I need to protect my eyes still. So a lot of times I look through the glass and then I'll just glance above a little bit too. This is a pretty small piece, so there's not that much radiant heat coming off of it, but if this were a two inch or bigger, I wouldn't be able to hold it as close to my face and look at it directly with my eyes without my protection. All right, that's looking pretty good. I'm gonna let it cool for a couple more seconds, then I'll break it off in the mold and fire polish the punchy mark. All right. Here's one last glance into the marble. Thanks for watching folks, hope you enjoyed the video and check out the other ones, we've got lots of tips and tricks in all these videos that I do, so check them out.